Hi gang, Professor Paul here with another Nuke tutorial. First up, I want to apologize, I've been MIA for the last few weeks. Been really, really busy wrapping up some projects, some actually some really cool feature film projects that are uh, hitting the festival circuit and, uh, and things like that over the next uh, couple of months. And uh, I've also accepted a full-time position teaching post-production at Arizona State University. So that's kept me busy the last couple of weeks gearing up for the fall semester. But we're back, and what I want to cover today is something that uh, usually gets a bad rap uh, in Nuke, and that's the particle system. I think that the particle system has its uses. Yes, it's got its limitations. Yes, it's got problems. Yes, it's difficult to learn. Uh, but I have used it on occasion for various projects, and sometimes uh, it's the best solution in a pinch for a project that is otherwise being manipulated in Nuke. Um, it sometimes just makes sense if you're working already in Nuke and you need some particles to just continue working in Nuke rather than going to another piece of software for uh, just for the particles. Uh, so we're, we're going to jump right into it and we're going to start at the top. We're going to start with the particle emitter node. Uh, and the particle emitter node is the the root of the entire system. And and this tutorial is probably only going to cover this node. We have uh, obviously a lot of particle nodes. What I'd like to do on this one is just be as exhaustive as possible on the particle emitter node. And then, um, and then in future tutorials, we can look at forces and things like that. So first things first, need to connect a viewer to the particle emitter. And that should put us in 3D mode if it doesn't hit tab and it'll take you there. And most people, when they see this, they are totally confused. They don't know what this is, right? What it actually is, is that we are seeing a stack of particles coming out. Uh, and the because the particle emitter begins at frame zero, right at frame one, you can see there is a stack of particles. And if I continue to zoom out, those particles just continue to expand upward and they they stop at a certain point and that has to do with the uh, emission rate and the uh, the lifetime on these particles but if you look at it you might not immediately realize that these are particles um, because they're just these giant boxes and they all kind of run together so if I make them smaller then you can see that they're actually particles now we've got a lot to cover there are three input pipes on this node and there are also a bunch of different attributes on the properties panel and we can just talk about what these different settings are. So you may know um, that all Nuke 3D nodes have the ability to change their display, right? So we can display it just as a wireframe or as a solid or as a textured. The default will be determined actually by the scene node that this is plugged into. Same thing with the render. We can render it as a wireframe or as a solid or as a textured. Um, so basically, you might you probably won't mess with these at all. Your start at, pretty obvious if you change the start. So let's say I go to frame 10 and I change my start to frame 11. From, zero, from 1 to 10, nothing's happening at frame 11 or frame 10. The, uh, the particle emitter has actually turned on. So frame 11 would be the first frame that we actually see particles. So that should be pretty self-explanatory. The next attribute, channels, all, none, A, B, new. We won't get into this today, but what the channels allow us to do is, you may notice there is a merge pipe on this node. Uh, and this allows us to actually pass multiple particle systems through uh, the same sets of nodes. And you might decide that, I don't know, you're emitting smoke and that's going to be channel A and also emitting uh, embers and that's going to be channel B because they're each going to behave differently when uh, when they hit physics. Um, there's also times when you can use forces to switch the channels. So something might get spawned as channel A, but as soon as it hits a particular surface, it becomes channel B and starts to behave differently. All right. Um, emit from points randomly no random direction okay this is where it kind of gets interesting so right now by default our uh emitter is just a single point and it has a single direction and no 
no variance in terms of the direction that it goes. Uh, so that's why we get this, this long line. But what's cool is you can actually feed any sort of geometry into this emit pipe. And then at that point, these uh, emit from points randomly, no random direction, will start to become useful. So let's say I create a sphere in Nuke and I connect that as my emission pipe or as my emit pipe. So now you can see that particles are emitting from, uh, from that surface. Let me take my number of rows and columns down just to simplify this a little bit. Let me also turn off any velocity on here so that the particles will just hover on the surface. I'm also going to change my display on my sphere to wireframe so we can see what's going on. All right, so right now, as we toggle through, you can see it's just sort of randomly spawning particles uh, at the points, at the, the uh, vertices on this sphere, right? So that is exactly what I expected because I expected that. I'm gonna just keep this open in the background. Uh, I expected that <clears throat> it would emit from points randomly. If I tell it emit from points uniformly, you can see it is now emitting from every single point all at once. Uh, if I tell it to emit in order, it is going to emit in the vertex order and kind of follow the contour of the object, okay? Uh, I can also change emit from points to emit from edges. Let me go back to uniform. So you can see the difference. If we zoom in here, change from points to edges, you can see it's spawning a lot more because it's spawning them on these edge lines between vertices. I can also tell it to emit from faces. And so it's now emitting from the center of each polygon that makes up the sphere. I can tell it to emit from the bounding box and you can see it is, uh, it is picking a, uh, a bounding box that fits inside the sphere to use as the emitter. So that becomes very powerful because now I can uh, change kind of how this thing behaves. And let's say I, I made this a card and fed this in. Change my card to wireframe. Let's say I wanted to have um, particles emitting from a flat surface like the ground flying upwards. And I wanted it to have a pretty high emission rate, so I'll crank that up. And then we can kind of turn up our velocity a little bit. All right. And now they're all just gonna flow straight up uh, from that surface. And whichever way I point the surface, let me stop my playback. Whichever way I point this guy, that's the direction Right, it's always going to going to flow from the the z axis because I have no random direction. If I choose a randomized direction, you can see it's going every which way. If I choose randomize outwards, it would be the same thing. Let me put that sphere back on, so we can see the difference between randomized outward. Let me close this card. Let me turn my sphere back down just a little bit. All right. So randomized direction, it's, cho it's essentially choosing a random direction for every single particle. When I choose random outwards, it's a little more uniform. I mean, the difference is minor in terms of, uh, in terms of the way that works. All right, so that kind of covers um, up to here. Let me also look at, let's say, Get rid of the uh, sphere. We'll open this card again and we'll reset this to minus 90. All right. And I'm going to give this a lot more rows and columns. Maybe a lot more. There we go. Something like that. Increase the scale. And I'm actually going to feed in a displaced geo after the card. And we'll throw a noise on here as my displacement map. 
There we go. So really quickly, I've just got a piece of deformed geometry that now is serving as the particle emitter. Close everything. So you'll see if I set my particle emission uh, velocity back to zero, and if I were to change this noise operator, right? So if I change the Z on the noise operator, it's going to evolve. So what's going to happen is as I change that Z, you'll see the displacement moving, right? So when I look at through the particle emitter, you'll actually see those particles moving as a result of that displacement, right? Because right now they're just emitting on the surface. They're just emitting on that surface. As the surface moves, the particles move. So that's kind of handy. Um, you can also, any piece of geometry that you could potentially import uh, with a read geo node, right? Anything that you could bring in with a read geo node, you can plug that in as, the, as an emitter, okay? So that's how that works. I'm going to actually just leave that just as it is. All right. So now, obviously, we have um, a bunch of different options in terms of our emission rate, right? The, uh, the higher this number, the more we're emitting. The lower the number, the less we're emitting. Let's just make it an even 100. All right. I'm going to leave this all exactly as it is. And you can see we just have our, our points randomly popping in. Uniformly makes them all level, right, all at once. And then in order, you can see how it's kind of scanning through the object. So that could be actually handy. Um, all right. So let's give this some variations. And as we dial through here, we have rate variation. So we can actually change that. Uh, it will basically randomize the number of particles that are being emitted at any given time. Uh, you'll also notice that we can, we have this thing called rate channel that we can feed in. So let's, for the sake of argument, feed in our displacement noise into the card as well. All right. And I'm going to just make a couple of quick adjustments to this. I want to make it a lot more extreme in terms of bright and dark. And I want to turn my size up so that way when I go back to my particles I've got a much more extreme kind of uh, displacement but I also have much more extreme uh, values of light and dark on this card so now if I tell it use any of these RGB, A, red, green, blue, or alpha. So what's being fed into the image here, right? Whatever's being fed into the image pipe, I can now tell it, use that for your emission channel. And so you can see it is now only emitting where the noise is white. And it's emitting more in the areas where the noise is brightest and less in the areas where the noise is darkest, right? So if I go back to my noise, and I start to change the Z value, you can see it is changing. Let me make it easier. I'm going to turn off the displaced geo so we can see it a little bit more easily. You can see how there are just no particles being spawned in these dark areas on the vertices that are in the dark areas. And if I change the noise, it changes where that's emitting. So that's really useful too. Um, because then you can use texture maps that are on your object or you can create texture maps to adjust the rate. All right, I'm going to go back to none. All right, maximum lifetime is in frames. Uh, it's the number of frames that each particle will exist for. Um, you, the higher you go, the more the particles will continue to live. So if I were to put a little bit of velocity on here and then also up the lifetime, maybe not that high, right? You'll see that many more particles will hang around for much longer time, right? The, the longer I make that lifespan, the more the particles will, will continue to exist, the longer, okay? Same thing, we can set a lifetime range. 
Uh, it produces a random variation, and then max lifetime value, it's a lot like the rate variation up here. So we might want to go, you know, just turn that up just a little bit so some particles last a little longer than others. Some will die sooner. It just makes it a little more, or a little more organic. All right, the other thing is we can also use um, a lifetime channel. Same thing, whatever's being fed into here. So again, the whiter areas, they're going to be the most, the longest lived. So let's go back to this and we'll just raise the gamma a little bit. There we go. So what you'll get is the particles that come out of the white area will live longest and the particles that will uh, come out of the dark area will live shortest. So again, that's another way to create some organic variation in terms of the, uh, the lifespans of uh, the particles that are coming out. All right. Next, we have our velocity, and you can see I've turned that up and down, right? You can control that by whatever increment you like. You can also create some randomization by increasing the range number. So some are going to be faster, some are going to be slower. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to do uh, this channel trick. So use the velocity channel. Uh, so now the particles that are coming off of the white areas, the lighter areas of our uh, of our card are going to be faster, and the ones that are coming off of the darker areas are going to be slower. I'll make that an even more extreme example. I'll turn up the gain and turn down the gamma. So you should see some particles that are just going to hug the surface and then others that are going to fly away. Right, so you can see it starts to get really powerful once we start manipulating these things, and that's one of the reasons why the uh, the particle tool is so difficult is because there are so many options. I mean, we we have already spent uh, about 15 minutes going over this, and we have barely scratched the surface. For uh, for example, our particles still look like crap, so we have a lot more to do. Okay, let me stop this, back it up, set that to none. We can also set rotation velocities, which I'll get into in a second, uh, because no matter what we do with our rotation, we're not gonna see anything right now because we're not really feeding any particles in. Um, we can also use, again, we can use uh, an incoming RGB channel or something like that to control your rotational velocity. Same thing for size, same thing for mass, which will really come into play when we start uh, working with um, physical forces. Mass will actually um, not really change anything right now. Our mass is not going to be any different because we have no physical forces, so no matter what we do to it right now, it's not going to change. So we, we probably won't even really touch mass or mass range or anything like that this week. But um, let's, let's make these particles into something because right now they're just these um, stupid little squares. Um, you know, some particle systems, they would have an automatic toggle somewhere that would be like, you know, emit squares, emit circles, emit spheres, whatever. Nuke's particle system does not have that. What it has is this particle pipe. And the particle pipe allows us to put anything into it, okay? So if I wanted just like simple circles, I might do, um, let's actually just make a roto node. And we'll set this roto node to RGBA. And we'll put a circle in the middle of it, right? So now I have a, a, a just a white dot, just a really simple white dot. Okay, go back to our particle emitter, and I'm going to feed that in. Hey, look at that! Now my now my um, my particle is now a dot. If I come back over here and I make them into this sort of teardrop shape. something like that. Now I'm gonna come back over here. There are all these little teardrops, okay? So that's really powerful in that I can feed any still image into, um, into this as a particle and it will then spawn those as particles, right? Uh, and I can, they can, this can be any color, it can be video, it can be uh, animation, it could be anything, right? So how does that help us? Well, let me show you something that I worked on a little while ago, and that was this spot right here for, uh, for Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. And this was a project that I knew was going to require a lot of particles. 
And I also knew that I was going to be asked to build this environment uh, using some 3D projection techniques. And I actually have a tutorial on 3D projection, which I'll, I'll link here. Um, but I knew I was going to use 3D projection. So my choices were um, work in 3D projection here in Nuke. Um, and then do my particles in Stardust, which is my preferred particle system over in After Effects, and then find a way to join them together. Or uh, work in Stardust and After Effects and do my part my uh, projection setup in After Effects, which I think is a little clunky. It's doable. Um, you can you, 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 there's some limitations you have to work around doing projections in uh, in After Effects, but um, but you can do it. But I, I felt like Nuke was going to give me the best options in terms of my projection, in terms of um, stand-in proxy geometry and things like that. So I decided uh, option number three, projection system in Nuke, particle system in Nuke. So here's what I ended up with um, is just a really simple environment built out of stock photos projected onto cards and proxy geo. And then uh, this whole particle system of all these uh, fruits and veggies and mushrooms and other probiotic type things flying up out of the bounty of the land and then falling down into the box. So, um, you know, for this, every one of these guys is a particle and the vast majority of them are actually um, footage that we shot like this where uh, it looks totally ridiculous. We shot a bunch of berries and mushrooms and you name it, skewered on this these green sticks and... Uh, and my DP shot at a high frame rate and I squeezed the trigger on my uh, cordless drill gently and we spun them around and then green screened, rotoed, basically isolated, created loops for each of these things. So if I go and grab, let me go grab uh, a couple of these guys out of the old project archive. We'll grab all five of the shiitake mushrooms and drag those in. All right, so now what I can do is each of these can get fed in as a particle. And you'll notice as soon as I feed in a particle, right, as soon as I attach a particle, another pipe appears right there. And you can make that particle two, right? Actually, let's make our particle size quite a bit bigger. And let's start attaching more particles. So you'll see as I start attaching them, that we now are getting a variation of particle types, right? So now I have all these different mushrooms. They're gonna just take a while for it to cache. Yeah, there you go. So I've got all these different mushrooms that are now flying out of this card, okay? All right, so now what we've got is down at the bottom, we have options. So right now, it is set to input order randomly, start at the first, right? So whatever the first, the, the, the one that is connected to the pipe that just says particle, that's particle two. Let's see, let's figure out which one of these is first. I probably should have connected them in order. Particle three. All right, that one's called particle. So this guy right here, shiitake number four is our first one. And so right now it is starting from the first and going randomly, or I can tell it to go in order uh, at random. You'll see it's now going to repopulate because it's now picking new ones. We'll give it a second. There it is, almost. So now it's picking these random sequences. Um, so we can change this and set it, leave it random, random and random. And then you've got advance in steps. And I want to make sure we get this one right because this one's sometimes a little confusing. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect all the particles except for one. And I'm going to turn my emission rate down. And let's turn our velocity down to zero so we can see what's going on. Let's just zoom in on one of these guys, right? All right, so right now, 
maximum clip length is set to 100. So basically after 100 frames, the rotation stops. You can see because the the video that I'm actually feeding in rotates and it continues rotating for a while. It's got, it's looped, right? It's set to loop. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to tell it advance in steps, maximum clip length, a thousand frames, let's say. So what's going to happen now is every particle, we'll give it a second. Every particle is updating every frame and they are just going to continue to rotate. So that's how we created the, the effect of those different mushrooms and stuff tumbling through space was we had um, the sequence fed in there. And so every one of them is now going to um, gonna play it. But here's the thing, you can see that there's a lot of human uniformity to it. If I change this, uh, let's see, random seed, turn that up, it's gonna randomize a bit um, and then I can advance randomly. See if I advance randomly they become this very herky-jerky kind of mess because it's not they're not picking continuous frames. If I pick constant then every single one of these will just be whatever frame it happened to be on whatever frame the playback of this uh, MOV happened to be on that's the frame that populates the, the particle. Okay so you've got all these different options here. I usually like to use in steps um, just because it keeps them all nicely moving, right? Let me go back out. Let me turn our uh, emission rate down even more. And let's turn our velocity back up some. So we get a lot of flying, spinning mushrooms. All right, so you get the idea. Now, the thing is, these may appear three-dimensional, but they're not. They're flat. They're flat cards. If you if you watch as I orbit around, I can never get around to the backside. Watch this one. The cap is facing camera. The cap is always facing camera. No matter what I do, I cannot get around behind it. Okay? So even though these give the appearance of 3D, uh, they're flat. And if your camera is moving a lot, it will give it away that uh, that these guys are not three-dimensional, that they're just flat images projected on a 2D sprite that is constantly facing camera. So the way we would fix that is we can actually feed in geometry. That's another thing that we can feed into this pipe. So if I were to create another sphere and set this sphere to say 10 and 10 and feed it in as a particle, hey, look at that. Let me actually turn the size down because they're way too big take our size way down. So now what I've got are a whole bunch of spheres that are actually legitimately 3D. Um, so you can feed that in and I could also feed in, you know, cubes, feed those in as a particle, right? And cylinders and whatever. So now I have uh, these geometric shapes that are being fed in, not just flat images. If you look at the cube, you can see in fact that we are orbiting around it in 3D. It has uh, depth, it has solidity. So, um, so which, which makes for uh, the ability, let me get rid of the cube, makes for the ability to do something like this. Let's take this displacement map and let's feed that in. And now you can see I've got um, my ge geometry on the sphere has been displaced according to what's happening in my noise operator. So let's do a little bit of refinement on this. Let's add some more vertices. Let's go back up to 30, 30. All right. And let's go back to our noise, take our yeah, something like that. All right. So you can see now we have sort of this lumpy um, chunk of debris or whatever, um, which can could work really well. Let's say we wanted to have every one of these particles be a different lumpy chunk of debris, right? Because right now this is not very uh, effective debris. Let's say we were uh, augmenting an explosion or something like that. Not very useful um, 
debris because every single piece of debris looks exactly the same. Well, here's how we do this. Let's animate our displacement by animating the Z value on our noise operator. Okay, so once I've got this this displacement animated over time, and I actually have uh, have turned it up quite a bit, so I am uh, I'm cycling from zero to one sixty, um, so that every frame is really drastically different. Every piece of this is very drastically different. Okay, so when I look through the particle emitter, if I were to just set this to um, uh, advance randomly, what's going to happen is the particles will theoretically change over time. What I don't, that's not what I want. I don't want the particles to be changing necessarily. I just want each individual particle to be drawing from uh, a different frame of distortion. So I will set that to constant. And what that allows for is what, it, however, met, uh, long I make this max clip length, that's how many different varieties of particle I have. So if I wanted to potentially use all 230 frames of variation in this sequence, I set that max clip length to 230. Now I have up to 230 different time slices that can be chosen for the particle shape. So as the particles uh, emit, every single one of them will be, uh, will be different and unique, right? So that gives me... Um, that gives me a lot more options. I'm going to turn down the number of um, rows and columns on my particles just to speed things up a little bit. And the next thing I want to do is I want to look at uh, this rotation velocity. So rotation velocity, if I turn this up, you'll see that as the particles spawn and fly out, they spin. Might be even easier to see this with cubes. Let's just make a quick cube. Why that guy? All right. So you can see that the cubes rotate um, with that rotation velocity. And again, I can use a an input channel for that. I can add some randomness to it. Um, you know what else? I can add some randomness to the size so that there's big chunks and small chunks. Um, and if I go back to our, wait for it. I might have broken my machine. There it is. So now every one of these is a different, slightly different size, um, moving at a slightly different speed, at a slightly different rotation. I'll turn my rotation velocity down just a little bit. And I can go grab, uh, we'll just grab a quick uh, grunge texture and drop this onto the sphere so we can actually see what's going on. So I've made a really quick, quick and dirty um, explosion of, uh, of particles. Obviously they need to be a lot faster. Let's go ahead and turn them way up. And let's set our start at, let's say, frame 10. And we'll take our emission rate and go to 50. And we'll set a keyframe here. Go two frames ahead. Drop it down to zero. Let's turn our... Size range down just a little bit. Velocity range up just a little bit. There we go. All right. So I have a nice little burst of chunky particles that I could use, you know, in a pinch to add to a comp. And I wouldn't have to go back to 3D. I wouldn't have to go to another particle system. Uh, you know, I would throw in a light to match my scene and all of that stuff. And, uh, and we're good to go. Um, obviously we need forces, um, gravity, things like that, collisions, etc. but there's, um, there's plenty of time for us to do that in another tutorial. 
obviously you can see that the um, particle emitter node unto itself, not even including any other particle system stuff, is really complicated and therefore very, very powerful. So, um, so experiment with it, have fun with it, plug in geometry, plug in different images, different sequences, things like that. Think about the things that you could potentially make with it. Um, experiment with it. That's, that is literally how I got to know the particle system is I just started messing with dials and started plugging things into pipes to see what was going to happen. Um, so next time I will, uh, I work on some particle physics for you guys and um and we'll we'll just keep moving ahead with uh with the particle system and see if we can't uh i don't know rehabilitate the new particle systems image so that people stop saying how bad it sucks all right um i want to thank my patrons especially for their patience while i've been radio silent for the last few weeks uh my patreon link is down below here's my list of patrons right now who are wonderful and are supporting the channel and I could not be doing this without you guys. I really appreciate it. Um, make sure that you like, you subscribe, you share. Uh, and if you can contribute something on Patreon, please do. I would really, really appreciate it. I will be back uh, a bit more frequently going forward. Next couple of weeks will just be about ramping up my classes at ASU and uh, and all of that. But I will be back. Um, I will be back sometime in the next couple of weeks. With the next particle tutorial, I will be doing some more After Effects tutorials uh, because I am teaching an After Effects class this semester. So I will be doing some After Effects tutorials to support that. So until next time, you guys keep making cool shit. Keep being nice to each other.